Hello and welcome to lecture 27 of the class From Data to Decisions. My name is Chris Mack, your instructor for this course, and today we're going to talk about the use of data transformations to uh, remove the problem of heteroscedasticity. And to begin, and we're going to do this in R, so to begin I have a script I called OLS and four graphs. It is a very generic um, example of doing an ordinary least squares regression and then generating four useful plots. Uh, I won't go through all the details, but let me tell you what I'm setting up here. I'm, I'm creating some simulated data. And I'm a big fan of using simulated data to understand general concepts and principles. So what we're going to do is uh, create data and add a little bit of noise to that data uh, to simulate what real data might be like. So here's the data. I begin by uh, setting up a, a set of equally spaced x values. So I use the sequence function to set x values that go from 10 to 40 in steps of 0.5. Then I'm going to have an ideal relationship that says y is equal to x squared. Uh, from that, I will use the r norm function to generate normally distributed random variables. Norm is the name of the distribution, the normal distribution. R norm means give me a random number from the normal distribution. The first parameter is n, the number of random numbers I want to grab, a of them. And then I can supply an array of mean values and an array of standard deviations, all of length n. So if I were to calculate uh, a set of random numbers, each of them centered or with a mean equal to the true value, then uh, the standard deviation about those means would be, in this case, 20, because that's what I've set it to be. All right, let's just run all this code, and then I'll explain what it does. Um, I selected it all, Control-R. All right, so the first thing I did after I generated a set of data is I ran a model. I did LM. LM models y versus i of x squared. i of x squared means I'm going to include the term x squared in the model. That's the only term I'm at putting in the model, so the complete model is y equals x squared. Over here, I show you the four graphs that I generated, and I'll let you look through the code for generating those graphs yourself if you download. Uh, this um, specific R script uh, from the course website. You can look through exactly how these graphs are generated. But I'm using a function called par that creates uh, an array of plots. In this case, I said uh, two by two array. Uh, so I'm going to put four graphs on one page. Now, down here in the corner of the screen, they're kind of hard to see. They're all squeezed together. So I'll hit the zoom button which pops up this whole uh, graph to be uh, in one page, blown up to where I can see everything at once. And now I see the four graphs that I generated. The first graph is the data points in the circles, simulated data, and then the red curve is the best fit line. That's the model equation of y versus x. Here I show the residuals, in particular the externally studentized residuals, which is what you should be plotting every time, versus the predicted y value down here. And if I look at this residual plot, I see everything looks like you'd expect a uniform spread of uh, these residuals about a mean of zero. The QQ plot also shows the same kind of thing, uh, the little wiggles everywhere, but that's just the way it goes when you have. I have here 60 data points and a Williams graph showing the magnitude of the ESR externally studentized residual versus the normalized leverage. And I don't see any outliers and a few high leverage points, but nothing to worry about. So a lot of information in four simple to interpret graphs. I like to use this script. Um, as just a generic way of doing linear regression. So I'll swap out you know, the fake data for reading in a real file. I put in whatever model I want, and then I can very quickly generate the four graphs for a quick 
view of what's going on. What I'm going to do is use this routine to change the assumption. So in my data, I assumed that a standard deviation was constant, 20 for every single data point. What if it's not constant? What if it varies? So let's make the standard deviation equal to 10 plus X, All right? So X goes from 10 to 40. And if the standard deviation is 10 plus X, that means it's starting at a standard deviation of 20, but it's growing to a standard deviation of 50. Uh, as a result, the, the range of standard deviations is 2.5. We said in the lectures that if the standard deviation varies by more than a factor of two, then you need to start worrying about it. All right, so let's just select this whole thing again and run it again, control R, and look at the plots that come out. Now, the standard deviation is changing by a factor of two and a half. And, you know, if you look closely, it does look like the data spread about the best fit line a little bit more uh, at the end than at the beginning. Uh, and the residuals, well, you got to look kind of closely to see that the residual spread is smaller down here and, and greater up here. You can sort of see that. Tell you what, you got to look close because, you know, you see a data point down here, up here. Or at the extremes, they, they're both kind of evenly spaced about the middle. I mean, it's, it's not exactly clear. And this is a two and a half times increase in the standard deviation. Look at the normal QQ plot. You see a problem there? No, in fact, this one, this particular case happens to look better than we've seen in uh, other uh, examples. So I'm not sure that you can tell much uh, that there's a problem, even though the standard deviation is changing by 2.5. All right, let's make a change more. Right? Instead of 10 plus S, let's make it uh, 2 times X. Now the standard deviation starts at 20 and goes to 80. So standard deviation is changing by a factor of 4. Let's see if we can notice that. Select the code again, Control-R. Zoom in on my four graphs. And now, it's, I think it's maybe a little bit clearer. But even, even then, it's it not sort of you see it's smaller here and bigger here. It's not a, a huge megaphone looking uh, behavior. Um, you know, we can always run it again since these are random numbers. Every time we do it, we'll get a slightly different result. Uh, and in fact, that's kind of a useful thing to do is try it a whole bunch of times because remember, random sampling distributions, every sample is going to be a little bit different. So here I ran it again, and now it's a little bit clearer. If I were to look at this, it does kind of look to me like a classic megaphone style, small variance beginning and larger variance towards the end. Another thing you notice, the QQ plot is starting to look like it has heavy tails. That's one of a sign of, of heteroscedasticity is uh, when you're looking at residuals of the QQ plots, if they look like they have heavy tails, it might be because the variance is varying and it's bigger in some places than others. All right, so now we, we can see that the variance is varying. We can see from the QQ plot a little bit of behavior that might not be what we expect. Um, looking at the residuals, now we can try to do something about it. What can we do? Well, our model is y equals x squared plus normally distributed residuals, in this case with heteroscedasticity. The equation, though, could be put in a different form. y equals x squared could become the square root of y versus x. So let me define a new variable, y prime, and set it equal to the square root of x, of y rather. So y prime is the square root of y. Now, I'm going to model y prime versus x. Now, from an equation perspective, it's the same. But from a model perspective, in linear regression, it's not the same because the errors are going to be different. 
I take the square root of y prime, I'm taking the square root of a standard deviation that's varying with x. Right? I just need to change one more thing in my plot. I'm going to plot y prime instead of y when I'm plotting the data. Now I can run this exact same code. Uh, I'm using, I'm not going to run the random number generator over again, so I'll use the exact same data that I was using before. But I'm going to plot or model y versus square root square root of y versus x. So now I, my data, I'm plotting y prime versus x, and it's a straight line because I took the square root and the y values. Um, now let's look at the way the residuals are changing. I don't see a megaphone behavior here. It looks more like a uniform spread of, of residuals. Uh, the QQ plot also doesn't look like it has heavy tails. Uh, everything looks kind of normal. Compare that to the previous graph where we saw this is the exact same data, both, but with and without the transformation. I see this growing residual variance uh, and what looks like maybe heavy tails on the QQ plot. Whereas when I fit square root of y versus x, things look better. So that simple transformation of the model, which is in fact the exact same equation, uh, but it changes the nature of the errors by doing that. And that's the power of using uh, data transformations for linear regression. One last topic, and that's the Box-Cox transformation. I have another uh, file called boxcoxdemo.r that's on the website. And here, we're going to do the same kind of thing, except I'm going to let this, uh, a routine that does Box-Cox transformations to try out a lot of different transformations of the data to see if one might be better. Here, I'm going to use a built-in data set in R uh, that's uh, called cars. Let's take a look at this data set. Basically, uh, it's I think it's data from the 1920s, but it looks at the stopping distance as a function of speed of a number of different cars. So you take a car, you drive it at a certain speed, you hit the brakes, and you ask how long does it take to stop, the stopping distance versus speed. And here's the data. Um, we'll look at what we think this data means in just a minute. But if we do our modeling, uh, which is, let's say, a linear model, distance versus speed, and then uh, we'll plot the residuals of that model, like we normally do. And it seems to look like that megaphone behavior. The spreads less uh, at the small stopping distances and greater at the larger stopping distances. That is maybe to be expected because if your stopping distance is 10 feet, well, how much variation can there be? When your stopping distance is 100 feet, there's a lot more possibility of variation in the stopping distance. So it kind of makes sense that small stopping distance will have small, smaller variation in that value. So what can we do? Well, we might try to transform the data and see if there's any transformations that produce better results. And we can do that with a function called boxcox. It's in the library mass, so you have to make sure that's uh, instantiated. And then we're going to just run boxcox. I'll give it a model as my input, and the model will be lm distance versus speed. And then I'm going to say, let's vary lambda from 0 to 1 in steps of 0.1. So that's all the inputs that, that, that I have here. Let's run that. And when I look at the graph, it produces the log likelihood versus lambda. So a higher log likelihood means uh, a better fit, smaller residuals uh, when I'm changing lambda. Uh, here it gives me, oh, I can. Uh, Look at where the maximum lambda is. So this little routine right here says uh, 
which index is the max value of y in that um, Potts Cox result. And then show me the x value at which that occurs, and that's max lambda. And we see over here that it's about 0.43. And uh, from the graph, there it is, 0.43. I also show a, a dotted line here that represents a 95%. Um, so 95% off of the max uh, goes from about 0.2 to about 0.65. So in fact, there's a fairly wide range of values of lambda that are close enough to the optimum. Uh, so we don't try to optimize too much here. I'm going to say lambda of 0.5 is probably a reasonable transformation. In other words, I'm going to use the square root transformation. So how about if I were to plot the square root of the distance versus speed? That would be a square root transformation. Notice that I'm changing the model. The original model was distance versus speed. The new model, square root of distance versus speed. And I look, and oh, that looks a little bit like a straight line. This one looks like it actually is curving up. Hopefully, when you're doing this kind of work, you have some theory that will help you decide what the model should be. And you probably, uh, if you remember your mechanics, uh, you could probably derive some equations of what you think the stopping distance would be uh, as a function of speed, uh, given some assumptions about the way it work and coefficient of dynamic friction, etc. Um, but nonetheless, from the data, it sure looks like a, a straight line on this plot of square root distance versus speed might be good. So we can model that and plot residuals. And there's my residual plot, and it looks more like a uniform set of residuals. So... We looked at the box cox. Um, it said a square root transformation might give us the best. But we also know that uh, square root of distance versus speed is the same as distance versus speed squared. So we could also uh, perform the same kind of uh, be, uh, modeling using distance versus speed squared. And I'm going to change my code up a little bit here really like to plot is residuals of this new model. I'll call it model three. And my model three distance versus speed squared. I run that and I get a new residual plot. And well, this looks like it has kind of that megaphone looking behavior of smaller residuals at, at small stopping distances and larger residuals at larger stopping distances. So even if y equals x squared is a better model, a better fit might come from the square root of y versus x. So we can see that Box-Cox transformations are valuable, uh, especially for exploratory work. You're trying to maybe, uh, explore a number of different equational forms that might produce the best results. But the real power of the data transformation is to look at the difference between y equals x squared and square root of y versus x uh, to see what it does to the error terms and see if we can remove heteroscedasticity or possibly make the errors more normal in their behavior. Well, that's this lecture. Uh, next time, it's all about weighted regression. Till then.